Hey there, everybody, and welcome back for session six of AP Daily Live Review for AP Physics 2. We are almost done getting you ready for the AP Physics 2 exam, and we're here today to focus on optics. All right, with, with that dad joke out of the way, let's get going. I'm Joe Mancino, and I teach at Glastonbury High School in Glastonbury, Connecticut. I'm also the high school co-chair of the AP Physics 1 Development Committee, but we're here today to talk about optics and getting you ready for the AP Physics 2 exam. So far, we've had a chance to talk about fluids and thermodynamics, to talk about electrostatics and circuits, I worked with you last session on magnetism. Tomorrow, we'll be working together through modern physics, and I will hand it off to eminent sage and scholar Othar Strauderman to tie a bow around this whole business and get you ready for the test in May. Now, certainly, there's some content that you have to know. And I expect that you have already gained some familiarity with all of this, with the electromagnetic spectrum. If not, we'll do a quick review with frequency, velocity, and wavelength, with how light gets polarized by polarizing filters, how light refracts when it changes media, how it diffracts when light passes through a small opening, how thin films and thin coatings work. And I think that in terms of geometric optics, you understand lenses and mirrors. But that's not what we're here to do today. Today, we're here to work on some AP exam questions. We're here to work on finding the index of refraction experimentally, a very frequently tested topic on this exam. We'll be linearizing a graph using a graph and using its slope to figure something important out. We'll be writing about diffraction, sorry, refraction, uh, and we'll be finding a lens's focal length experimentally. Now, there are a lot of topics that we're not reviewing in depth today. Between the AP Daily videos and last year's AP Daily Live review, you have tons of options for studying the content. The goal today is to apply what you know to some AP test questions. But of course, there's gonna be a very brief content overview, like, hey, here's what you know about the electromagnetic spectrum. We have to use it. So uh, from lowest frequency to highest frequency, or from longest wavelength to shortest wavelength, the order of the electromagnetic spectrum, radio waves, microwaves, infrared rays, visible waves, ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma. I expect that you know the relationship between the wavelength of light, the velocity of light, and its frequency. Now, V is the speed of light in any particular medium. F is the frequency of that light wave, regardless of medium. And the Greek letter lambda represents light's wavelength in that particular medium. A light wave has a frequency, and that frequency uh, either you know, would cause a, a long wavelength if the velocity is high, or a short wavelength if the velocity is low. But there's a trade-off between wavelength and velocity. Okay, you also need to know about all of this other content. And where would you find it? Well, uh, Ms. Mosley and Mr. Blazo described the EM spectrum and the wave nature of light in Unit 6, uh, Topics 1 and 2. You can find all of their very helpful videos right there. And if you take a look at last year's AP Daily Live Review, you'll find me talking about these slides with a lot more content. OK. You'll also learn all about polarization in uh, all of topics 1, uh, sorry, 6.1 and 6.2. Now, Mr. Blazo and Ms. Mosley do some excellent demonstrations, uh, and you'll also see some simulations as well. So if you have questions on the polarization of light, or on the EM spectrum, that's the place to go. In terms of how light refracts, you need to understand what the index of refraction 
means. Uh, a material's index of refraction compares the speed of light in that material to light's speed in a vacuum. Now, C, light's speed in a vacuum, is a universal constant, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. But the speed in a given material can change. Well, we call that ratio the index of refraction. We call it that because it affects how light refracts. Refraction is the also the bending of light because of its change in speed when it changes media. If uh, in, in this case, if n1 is less than n2, light bends toward the normal when it changes media. If n1 is greater than n2, light bends away from the normal when it changes medium. And at a certain incident angle, if n1 is greater than n2, there exists an angle such that the light will not refract into the second medium. It will instead reflect. Now, that's a lot of content that I'm just going to click on past. But you know where to review, because today we're here to practice. This is a frequently tested topic. So if you would like to see some review on this, well, you can see Mr. Blazo doing it in daily video three and four for topic 6.4. And I'll spend a much longer time with it if you check out uh, the 2021 live review session six because we're jumping in. So the lab question as asked says you have a glass block in which the path of a light ray can be seen as the light travels through the glass. And it's your job to design an experiment to measure the index of refraction of the glass. The question goes on to tell you that a linear graph is to be used to determine the index of refraction of the glass. Your job is to indicate quantities that should be graphed and describe how the graph could be used to determine the index of refraction. Okay, there's a lot to unpack in this, even though it seems like a pretty standard prompt. First off, it says design an experiment. That means you have to come up with the steps, with the procedure, with the equipment, with a detailed description of the measurements necessary to get this data. But we're also clued in that a linear graph is to be used. So you have to specify quantities that could be graphed so that the plot would be a line, not any other shape. That means you have to indicate the quantities that could be graphed, which will be different from the quantities that you record in your procedure. After you say what to graph, you have to say uh, how the graph could actually be used. How should people interpret the graph that you've produced? OK, so that's our job. Well, in order to figure out what equation we should use to guide our thinking as we consider what this graph is going to look like, we need to look at Snell's law. Now, you don't need to know that it's called Snell's law. You may never have been taught that. Uh, and that's, that's fine. You're not required to know the names of any individual rule in physics. The idea that the index of refraction times the sine of the angle of incidence is uh, in, in one material is equal to the index of refraction times the sine of the angle of refraction in the other material. And then we rearrange it for the index of refraction of this piece of glass that we've been given. And you may notice, uh, hey, it says n sub air there. Well, we all know that the index of refraction for air is really, really close to one. Uh, so you can ignore that if you're comfortable knowing that the index of refraction for air is about one. All right. So algebraically, I'd say that the index of refraction for glass is the sine of the angle of incidence divided by the sine of the angle of refraction. Well, that's a division expression sine theta air divided by sine theta glass. And anytime I see division, that's a great clue that I could use those values as my, uh, use the numerator as my y-axis variable, the denominator as my x-axis variable, and then the, the plot would turn out linear. 
So if we do this lab, and you may have done this lab in class, if not, just check out the AP Daily videos. Mr. Blazo does this lab uh, and graphs the sine of those angles against each other and gets data that looks something like this. It is really linear. Well, once you have a bunch of data plotted on a graph, you know that the next thing to do is sketch a line of best fit. Now, in this case, it really is a line. When you sketch a line or curve of best fit, you are interpreting the pattern that you see. Your pattern recognizing brain is saying, yeah, you know what? That looks like a line. I'm going to draw it like a line. But I want you to notice that when I've drawn the line, I faded out that data. We don't need the data anymore. The data informed us about the shape of the line, and now we're done with it. Well, if we've drawn our line really well and, and traced that data well, the index of refraction for glass is the slope of the data. OK, so we've made a linear graph. We've defined what quantities should be on the x and y axis. And we've explained how to analyze the graph. We're going to calculate its slope to find the index of refraction. But that's just how we're going to analyze the data. We still need to get this data. So here were the instructions. Outline an experimental procedure that could be used. Include sufficient detail. Reference the equipment that you would use. All right. So when you see a prompt like this, I'm hoping that you've practiced questions like this enough to know that it's, it's a just the facts kind of situation. There's no need to talk about gathering equipment, recording data in your notebook, or cleaning up your lab station when you're done. Those are important things maybe to write about for a lab report in class. It's always important to clean up and, and wear appropriate safety equipment. Uh, but the exam readers are not looking for that. You only have 90 minutes to construct responses to all four of the free response questions. So don't spend time on the lab question uh, as you write your experimental design talking about steps that are unnecessary. But that bottom highlight where it says equipment, we got to talk about that. Talk about equipment you've actually used to do a, a virtual lab or an in-person lab. Know the names of common equipment that shows up on the AP Physics 2 exam. So I'd like to discuss how I might write this. Well, first, if I have a light and I want to see it refract, I know that I need a narrow beam of light. Now, I might shine it through a slit in a piece of paper. Uh, I might use a laser pointer, something like that. If you've done refraction labs in your class or virtually, you always use a line of light, not just a, a light bulb or a light source. We measure the incident and refracted angles relative to the normal with a protractor. Now, I've packed a lot into that, and I want to take a moment to take it apart. First of all, I've specified a tool. We are going to use a protractor. That's a tool for measuring angles and a common one. We're measuring the angle relative to a normal line. That's how Snell's law works, and that's how you've done it in the past if you've done a similar lab. Now, I mentioned using incident angles between 0 and 70 degrees in 10 degree increments. If you measure a lot of data incrementally, you're going to spot the pattern. It's also good practice to double check those measurements. You might say measure them several times. In a situation like this, in which the light beam isn't moving, repeating the trial didn't make uh, a lot of sense, I thought. So we're going to take seven different measurements. Uh, nope, that's eight different measurements if we go from zero to 70. Now, I stopped at 70 because I know when I do this lab in my class at 80 degrees, that laser beam gets too blurry. But if you said zero to 90, that would be fine. All right, the question continues. Predict how the path of the light will change as it enters the glass. Support your prediction using a qualitative comparison of the speed of light in the glass and the speed of light in air. Now, when you see 
comparison of the speed of light in different materials, I hope you're hearing that's a clue that we might want to reference the index of refraction. We might want to think about the index of refraction, which is certainly higher for glass than it is for air. So light is slower in glass than it is in air. And I know that because the index of refraction is higher. Light is slower in basically anything than it is in air, which means that regardless of what angle I shine this light on, the beam will bend toward the normal. And those two sentences are enough to satisfy the question. So when you see a prompt like this that asks for a brief explanation of something, make sure that you've double checked your answer. Did you answer both parts of the question if it contains multiple parts? Did we predict how the path of light will change? And did we make a qualitative comparison of the speed of light in glass to the speed of light in air? Well, yeah, right here I can tell we've definitely done both objectives. So we're going to call that one done. It is very important that you understand how this lab gets done. It's a very frequently assessed topic, both in the free response and the multiple choice portions of the AP Physics 2 exam. But we aren't done with refraction questions. We have one more, a favorite of mine. It's the drinking glass question. You may have seen something like this before. I don't know. Here is a drinking glass. And the index of refraction for the glass is 1.52. The drinking glass holds some liquid with an index of refraction of 1.33. A narrow beam of light enters the glass perpendicular to a curved surface and reaches 0.0 with an angle of incidence theta 1. The flat bottom of the glass is frosted so that bright spots appear where light from the beam strikes the bottom surface and doesn't reflect. The frosted surface is only the flat part there at the bottom. So when theta equals theta 1, two bright spots named x and y appear on the bottom surface of the glass, and there they are. So that's the situation. We've shined a laser at the bottom right corner of a glass, and we see two dots on the frosted bottom of the glass. That's weird because we're shining one laser in and getting two dots out. All right, let's see what the question says. Oh, there it is. In a coherent paragraph length response, describe the processes involved in the formation of those dots. Include an explanation of why spot Y is located farther from the right side of the drinking glass than spot X and what factors affect the brightness of the spots. All right, there's a lot to a question like this. In addition to one of those experimental design questions, you are definitely going to see one of these paragraph length response questions. In a question like this, the readers are looking for some very specific physics points, and they're also looking for several linked, on-topic, independent, different ideas. So we need to parse out all the parts of this paragraph, make a list of what we need to write. When you see this phrase on the AP Physics 2 exam in a coherent paragraph length response, let that be a trigger for you. You have about a 10 minute window to earn those points. So. The first thing I would do as a student is write down what I'm supposed to talk about so I can check back later and make sure that I've done it. Well, we have to discuss the processes involved in the formation of spots X and Y. We have to talk about why spot Y is located further left than spot X. And we also need to talk about the factors that affect the brightness of those spots. All right. If we do those three things, then we've fully answered the question. Well, let's go. First off, I know that some light reflects at point O and makes point X. Anytime light hits a surface, 
Some is reflected and some may be refracted, depending on the angles and refractive indices. But some light is definitely going to be reflected. So I have explained the process involved in the formation of point X. I'm done talking about point X. But now we have to figure out where point Y comes from. Well, like I said, some light gets reflected and some gets refracted. And you're probably thinking, well, at point O, yeah, some of that light refracted into the liquid and then reflected back off the lower surface of the air back into the liquid. And then that same beam of light refracts back into the glass farther to the left. OK. So, oh, that should say farther to the left than point x. I apologize for that. Point y is farther to the left than point x. And this diagram, along with this text, explain why it is where it is and how it was formed. But I'm not done yet. We also have to discuss what factors affect the brightness of these dots. Well, spot Y is dimmer than spot X because some of the light energy that made spot Y was absorbed by the liquid. Some of that light energy passed into the air. I never drew the beam that transmitted into the air, but certainly some of it did. Now, if you said all of this, that would have earned you you full credit for this question, but I do want you to notice that's not a lot of words. The readers of the AP Physics 2 exam are not looking for a ton of words. They're not looking for great spelling or great grammar or great punctuation. They're looking for really good on topic linked logical physics. Okay, let's continue. Now, if you didn't draw a diagram in this particular year when you were drawing your when you were writing your paragraph length response, that was fine. Uh, but the question went on and said, when theta is increased from theta one to theta two, one of the spots becomes brighter than it was before due to total internal reflection. We're asked to draw a ray diagram that clearly and accurately shows the formation of spots X and Y when theta is increased. Well, first off, which of those rays would become brighter because of reflection? Well, X is already made by reflection. It's as bright as it's going to be because of reflection. But if we look at spot Y, some of spot Y's energy left into the air. If that angle were steeper, and I'm going to change it to theta 2, if that angle were steeper, you'll notice that the light at the liquid air interface reflects internally, and no light is transmitted into the air. So that's our ray diagram uh, that shows which spot, sorry, that, that shows why. Uh, spot Y has moved over. And then the question continues, well, which spot became brighter than it was before? If you say something like spot Y becomes brighter because no light was transmitted into the air, that shows that you understand this, this ray of light is the light energy that can be transmitted elsewhere. Okay. Finally, we're going to increase this angle again. When theta is increased to theta 3, one of the spots disappears entirely. Oh, that's weird. We need to draw a ray diagram that clearly and accurately shows the formation of the remaining spot when theta is increased. Oh, boy. Well, when this angle increases more, what's going to happen? Well, eventually, Theta 3 is going to be so large that at point O, the beam will totally internally reflect. Well, which spot disappears because of total internal reflection? Well, we see the light ray coming in there. It gets to point O and totally internally reflects, forming spot X. And there it is. 
spot y disappears because total internal reflection occurs at point O. Now, this is an excellent full response about reflection and refraction. And I especially love this question because it's about everyday observations made with macro scale objects. And really, that's what AP Physics 2 is all about. AP Physics 2 is the study of how invisible microscopic causes have observable macroscopic effects. And you, as a brilliant AP Physics 2 student, need to identify the very tiny causes of some very big effects. All right, next topic up is the topic of diffraction. Diffraction demonstrates light's wave nature. A light wave that passes through multiple small openings interferes with itself. Cool. Interference is a property unique to waves. This doesn't work or make any sense if we consider only light's particle nature. Now, there are a lot of relationships that you need to understand about diffraction. First of all, when light of a particular wavelength, uh, light of wavelength lambda, approaches multiple small openings, that light spreads out, interfering with itself. And on some distant flat surface, right there, on some distant flat surface, you'll see uh, brighter dark spots or brighter dark bands, depending on uh, some properties of the situation. Now, that relationship uh, will, will always be governed by this, d sine theta equals m lambda, where m is counting how many bright dots from the center we're, we're looking at. So when m equals 0, that's right there in the center. When m equals 1, that's one bright dot away from the center. When m equals 2, it's two bright dots away, etc. And if that angle is very small, we can use what's called the small angle approximation. All right, so we need to know some consequences of this. We need to know that the spacing of those narrow slits affects the spacing of the light. In last year's AP Daily Live review video, I showed that closer slit spacing makes the dots further apart. And that when the slits are farther apart, the dots are closer together. Also, I showed that the greater the wavelength of the light, the greater uh, the spread between the spots is. And the smaller the wavelength of the light, the closer together those spots are. But if you want to see why the bright spots appear where they do, Ms. Mosley will be happy to explain in AP Daily Video 3 for Topic 6.6. .6. If you didn't get to do a lab like this during class, you can do one right along with Mr. Blazo in AP Daily Video 4 for Topic 6.6. .6. OK, our next topic of conversation is thin films. Now, what you need to know for thin films is that when light traveling through uh, a material with a lower index of refraction, like air, uh, bounces off a surface with a higher index of refraction, like water, it undergoes what we call a 180 degree phase shift. So instead of crest trough, crest trough, crest trough, it goes crest trough, crest, crest trough, crest etc. But if light is in a material with a higher index of refraction and reflects off one with a lower index of refraction, there is no phase shift. You do need to know this. When a very thin layer of one material coats an object made of another material, interference occurs as the light reflected off the outer surface meets light reflected off the inner surface. So when light goes through a really thin material, it interferes with itself. The two reflections of the same ray are so close together that they overlap. 
and they add up like waves. The thickness of the coating, whether or not the light undergoes a phase change, all of that matters and determines whether the light interferes with itself constructively or destructively. And there's a lot to think about there. So if you'd like more work with thin films, well, guess what? AP Daily videos five and six in topic 6.6 .6 will help you out. You also need to know all about lenses. First of all, just to get some nomenclature out of the way, concave lenses are also called diverging lenses because the refracted rays always diverge. Concave lenses can only form virtual images. Convex lenses are known as converging lenses because the refracted rays that pass through converge. In fact, when the rays come from really, really far away and enter that lens almost uh, parallel with each other and parallel with the principal axis of the lens, they meet up right there at the focal point of the lens. Convex lenses can form real or virtual images. You need to know the rules of ray tracing, and you need to be pretty good at it, pretty quick at it. Um, so if you haven't done any ray tracing practice recently, hey, now would be a good time to go to your teacher and say, hey, teacher so-and-so, I would really love to do some ray tracing practice. I'm sure they've got some supplies for you. Okay, so that's that's the ray tracing need to know. Those are two of the three principal rays that you might want to draw. You also need to know the thin lens equation and be pretty quick with using it in your calculator. I have a lot of students that can definitely do this, but under the stressful tick-tock of the clock, they get some of those uh, fractions incorrect. They, they flip-flop the fraction the wrong way. So maybe practice this a few times before you go into the test. Then there's just stuff you need to know about lenses. So as I said, a diverging lens can only make a virtual image. A converging lens can make a real image or a virtual image, depending on where the object is. Virtual images are made of diverging rays. It, for a virtual image, the image distance is always negative. Virtual images are always upright. Real images are made where rays actually converge. Where the image distance is positive, real images are also always inverted. Real images are projectable. So we've talked about a couple of different ways for determining where you would find the image of an object by using a lens. Whether you're drawing the, reflect the refraction of light in and out of a lens, you're drawing a ray tracing diagram, and calculating the image location, you're, you're really doing the same thing three different ways. Light follows the law of refraction because it travels at different speeds in different media. And the result is that carefully constructed lenses, like the double spherical lenses we're always talking about in AP Physics 2, can make images. But also, your careful drawings and careful calculations can predict the location of those images. Uh, so here's a common optic setup that'll help us find the focal length of a thin lens by finding combinations of object distance and image distance that result in a sharp, clear image. And if you'd like more practice with this, you guessed it, Mr. Blazo teaches about ray diagrams in AP Daily Video 1 uh, in Topic 6.5, and Ms. Mosley collects and analyzes data in a lab. Oh, also Topic 6.5, Daily Video 4. For even more, if you want to hear more from this guy, check out last year's AP Daily Live Review, Session 6. Because guess what? We're going to use it. We're going to practice right now with another experimental design task. Okay, students use this equipment to demonstrate a lens's focal length. Sorry, to determine a lens's focal length. Light shines through a plate and is focused by a lens onto a screen. Uh, and notice there is a very distinctive shape drawn on the plate. 
So the light box shines light through the plate, through the lens, and onto the screen. The first part of this question was, how does the image appear to the students? And the test had a, a place where you could draw the image. Well, a projectable real image is always going to be inverted. So there we go. That shows that the image has been inverted from the orientation of the object. Now we're given some data. The plate is 20 centimeters from the center of the lens. The image is clear when the screen is 30 centimeters away, and we're asked to calculate the focal length of the lens. Well, if you're comfortable using the thin lens equation, you're going to write this down, and you're going to drop in that data, the data that we were given. Now, I would suggest you pause this video and actually try to do it. I know that as a student, when I was taking AP Physics, I would be really confident until I actually had to do something. So pause it, try it out. Do you get 12 centimeters? If you got 12 centimeters, hey, that's great. If you didn't get 12 centimeters, that just means that you need some extra practice with your calculator, maybe some extra algebra practice. Okay, now it's our job to calculate the magnification of the image. Well, right from the equation sheet, I know that the magnification is also the ratio of the image distance to the object distance. Certainly, it's the ratio of the image height to the object height, but we don't have that information here. So it says that the absolute value of the magnification is uh, 30 centimeters divided by 20 centimeters, or 1.5. The equation on the AP Physics 2 equation sheet is for the absolute value of the magnification, and you need to figure out if the image is flipped or not. An inverted image would have a negative magnification. Not to be worried about that on the AP Physics exam, though. Absolute value will do just fine. All right, this arrow represents the bright object created by the plate. Let's draw a ray diagram that is consistent with our calculations for the focal length and the magnification. All right, let's go. Well, first off, I know that the focal length of this lens is 12 centimeters, so I'm going to make some dots at the 12 centimeter marks. Now, my task is to draw a ray diagram, and look, it says consistent with my calculations. Well, those blue dots mean it's consistent with my calculations. If you calculated a different number for that question, but you put your dots where you calculated the number, you could still earn full credit for this question. Now, we need to draw a ray diagram. And I'm going to draw three rays, but if you just draw two, that's fine. I always like to start with the easiest one, that rays through the center of the lens are unrefracted. That's just the easiest one to draw. Now, the next one, the next rule I would follow is that rays uh, that travel parallel to the principal axis before being refracted, refract through the opposite focus. So there we go. There's the formation of the second ray. And you can see those two lines cross at about the 30 centimeter mark. And that's where I calculated, no, sorry, that's where the question said that the image was formed. Finally, rays that pass through one focus refract parallel to the principal axis, again, crossing at the 30 centimeter mark. So I know that the image of the tip of that arrow is right where those lines cross. So it must be that the image of the arrow itself is about there. But remember, it said that our diagram should be consistent with our calculations for F and for M. Well, being consistent with M means that the ratio of the lengths of these two arrows, if it's consistent with M, the ratio of that length should be about uh, 1 to 1 1.5. And when I look at them, yep. One looks about 50% larger than the other. All right. Now, why are they going to do this? I don't know. But it comes up an awful lot, right? The entire apparatus is then submerged in water with an index of refraction greater than that of air. 
and less than that of the lens. So on each figure, we have to draw the ray as it passes through the lens and back into the water. Well, in air, when the light ray enters the lens, it'll refract a little and it'll reflect, refract a little bit more when it gets out the other side. So there we go. But the amount of refraction depends on the difference in the values for the index of refraction. The closer those two numbers are, the less refraction there is. So in the right side diagram, where we're asked to draw uh, the light passing through the cross section of that lens, when the lens is in water, it matters that those n values are more similar. Notice neither of those angles are as extreme as they are when the lens is in air. There is less refraction when the two indices of refraction are pretty close. OK. The next question in this set was for us to answer, how does the focal length of the lens when it's in air compare to its focal length in water? Now you're probably thinking, come on, Mancino, you know, the lens just has a focal length. It doesn't matter what it's in. And for most purposes, it doesn't. It's unlikely that I'm going to try to use my glasses underwater. I'm probably not going to ask my students to focus lenses underwater. But that doesn't mean it wouldn't have a different focal length. Remember, the focal length is the point at which the lens would focus light from a very distant source so that those rays are traveling parallel. And that point depends on the relative index of refraction. So as you can see, the light leaving the lens in air is bent a lot more than the light leaving the lens in water. So rays leaving the lens in air would cross closer to the lens than they would uh, if they were traveling through water. So the focal length in water is greater because the difference in n determines how much the light bends, and the difference in n is less. The question continues. How do the image size and image distance when the lens is in air compare to the image size and image distance when the, when the, when the lens is in water? Well, all right. If the light is bending less when it's in water and bending more when it's in air, I know that the rays will cross closer to the lens when it's in air and farther away when it's in water. OK, because the focal length is longer when the lens is in water, the image size is larger and the image distance is larger. OK. Finally, you were asked to tie all of this together and explain how the rays drawn in the figures support the answers that you just gave. So any set of statements that link the bending of these light rays to the answers that you just gave would be great. What I said was the ray doesn't bend as much when it passes from water to glass or glass to water, which means parallel rays will converge farther away. That's the longer focal length. Rays from an object also converge farther away, so the image distance is greater. All right, and that wraps it up for that question. We've done some calculations, we've done some drawings, and we've explained how the drawings and the calculations are similar. A question like that, even if it's about an experiment, is called a qualitative quantitative translation question. You have to describe something qualitatively by drawing or comparing pictures. You have to describe something quantitatively by actually calculating a number. But moreover, you have to do what we just did here and say how those two representations talk about the same thing. Uh, our next quick topic for discussion is mirrors. And then, friends, we are done with optics. OK, you need to know the anatomy of different kinds of mirrors and the types of mirrors that there are. If you're not comfortable with this, ask your teacher for some practice. 
you need to know the mirror equation, which looks an awful lot like the thin lens equation. And those same rules for image formation still apply. Virtual images are formed by diverging rays. Virtual images are upright. Real images are formed by converging rays, and they're inverted and projectable. All right, folks, we've done it. Well, what have we done? First, I showed you how to find the index of refraction of a material experimentally by using the slope of a graph. And we linearized that graph. Also, we wrote about refraction and drew some pictures of refraction. We talked about ways to find a lens's focal length experimentally and then draw the path of the light through that lens. So that's it, folks. We have discussed six of the seven topics in AP Physics 2. It has been an absolute blast, and I can't wait to hang out with you next time as we tackle topic seven, modern physics, and then Mr. Strauderman brings it home and sends you out ready for success on the AP Physics 2 exam. Thanks a lot, everybody. I can't wait till next time.